So I would invite Dr. Bush to start. Yes. Um, Good evening. I would like to, I think I, I will ask uh, Chef Casa Peralta because I think you mentioned it first, but everybody, but to everybody really, uh, since you mentioned in the buffet line, if you have ever foraged for wild plants or mushrooms, have you ever, have you worked with, or caught, hunted your own or acquired your own wild game? Uh, and how is that different from working with agricultural ingredients or you know standard standard grocery store ingredients? Yes, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, um, like I said, as, as a kid, I've always loved to eat. <laughs> That's why I made it my profession. It's not for the money. Uh, and, uh, and to this day, I, I kayak and um, I have some videos that I, uh, I forage oysters. We have a very big oyster population in the Gulf, specifically Brownsville, Port of Brownsville. Um, and uh, every time I go there with my kayak and no rods, uh, the senores, the fishermen are like, ¿Está haciendo? and I'm like, uh, <laughs> sir, like just oysters, you want some? And I always say, you want to take a shot with me? Oh, yeah. yeah, and they're like, no, te vas a enfermar. <laughs> and I'm like, no, yes, it's very, right? So they think, even though they're fishing there, they're like, you're going to die of polluted water intake. There's also sea urchins in our jetties. Um, so I forage that too. Um, and then little, uh, the purslane, the petals that you had in this soup, um, the inland one, it actually, somebody said it grows in their backyard. Where, 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 so you make your kids eat it, right? Yeah, <laughs> so cool. Mom points. Um, and at the beach, it tastes like sal y limon, like the little packets because of the salinity of the water. Um, I also forage some seaweed there too, just throw it in my pasta. So yeah, I, that's somewhat, sometimes how I forage uh, in the valley and there's still things that I want to intake, but rule of foraging, you must identify before you taste, okay? Don't be all cool and not geo, no, no, no. Like, do your research. So yeah. Yeah, so you, you indicated you, have, you, you foraged for us tonight, didn't you, yeah. Chef Garza? Yeah, so t tell us about your experiences. With like for, for foraging in general, in, what, whatever, it, as general. <laughs> it was mine. As you want to answer. It was yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but like the nopales that were harvested for the dish. I mean, like we live in a tiny apartment complex, and then next door there's just like an empty lot, um, and like since it had been raining recently, like the nopales were all like small and cute, and I was like, those are gonna be really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like. I took him there, and then um, at the complex, our, our handyman, um, he is also, like, he's, like, one of the only Mexicans in that complex, and he's also the only other person that's harvesting those nopales. Um, so it was just cute to do that. The mesquite, too, um, <laughs> those were gifted uh, from a friend's ranch um, at the restaurant. Like, we've been sourcing and buying mesquite like in bulk um, from this family out in Seguin, Texas. Um, and that's been really wonderful because like mesquite as a culinary like ingredient isn't as like popular anymore. Um, and the times I've seen it has been like in baking applications. So this is like mesquite cookies uh, or mesquite sourdough. But for me, like to read like the word mesquita mal, it was all together. Like it was, there was no hyphen or like space. I was just like, there's something to that too, and to see mesquite as like our ancestor as something that like we can connect to that just grows like so abundant in these lands is is crazy. Uh, but also like knowing that mesquite is growing so much more and like taking the water out of the soil because of like the cattle industries pretty like interesting um and then like the little chiles are also like foraged by different friends and it's cute to have like these relationships where we're all just passing uh seeds and plants to each other and just trying to do honor to that thank you yeah i grew up <laughs> crabbing we did a lot of crabbing and fishing but it was all of my tios with my dad, y se emborrachaban. <laughs> 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 There'd be music, so it was like all the kids were crabbing. 
but I mean, we were great at it, you know? So it'd be like, we'd, when we were, we'd be, get to stay up the entire night. So by the time they would get up from the cruda, you know, and they wanted, we had buckets full of crabs. So I grew up doing a lot of crabbing, a lot of fishing with all my tios. Good memories, very funny memories. Some would fall off the boat because todo tiempo estaban borrachos. But it's, it was great memories. My mom made some really great stuffed crabs that I've been failed to recreate. I, it, I can't get it quite perfect, but um, yeah, crabbing, fishing in the coast. So good memories. So um, I was a big, big hunter, uh, I mean, kind of where we're from. Uh, hunting is kind of like a, a pastime, you know, and so it definitely, like as a family, we would use venison, um, uh, cottontail, quail, doves during the season. You know, there's, there's a lot of proteins available to us. Um, uh, I don't hunt so much anymore, uh, as much as I used to, um, and it's definitely not stuff that we can use in our restaurant, but one thing that... I used to do um, is prickly pears. Uh, our ranch is full of, of prickly pears. So uh, come summertime, you know, I would go out and I would pick them and I would make uh, a shrub for one of our margaritas uh, out of the prickly pear. Um, and then one year, you can never tell how they're going to come out because one year it rained right before they were about to be ready and they were just super watery. Um, so sometimes we just have to use, uh, you know, something that's just packaged. Um, I found wild oregano growing on one of the hills uh, of our ranch, and that was fabulous. But to get there, I mean, Laredo, if you're not familiar with, with it, it's thorny brush, and it's very, very thick brush. Uh, so it's kind of painful to walk through it. Uh, you get scratched a lot. And then, you know, the other day I was, I was actually uh, in the brush, and this is probably not going to be a very pleasant story, but um, I came back, showered, and then I went with my family to San Antonio. And the next day... We were driving, um, and my wife looks at me, and she's like, what's that on your ear? And I'm like, what? And she's like, oh, my God, it's a tick. She started screaming. We pulled over to a cracker barrel, and she's waving her hands everywhere. She's like, oh, my God, you have a tick. And I'm like, well, I mean, it happens sometimes. You're in the brush, and these things happen, you know. Get it off, get it off. And so there was this guy next to us in a camper just looking at us. He was in a camper in the parking lot of the Cracker Bell, just looking at us. And we're, you know, she's there in the car like this, and my son is like, calm down, Mom, calm down, Mom. And I'm like, well, you know, I took it off. And, and so I'm like, well, I need, I need to make sure that it's not, like, you know, something that carries Lyme disease. So I put it on the paper, and she's like, what are you doing? It's going to get away. Anyway, it was a big fiasco. But the perils of foraging in Laredo, um, for sure, anyway, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was very memorable, <laughs> that experience, for sure. I have a question for Vianney or for any of you four. It's a general question, but in going over your recipes and everything, is I wanted to um, ask you is, how has your preparation changed since you were a child? I mean, uh, and by that preparation process, I mean, you know, do you have different cooking techniques that you have applied to this dish through, through time? Or have you added ingredients or took out ingredients? And... The, the re and I just want to know that is, or maybe you can talk about some of the mistakes that you made along the way in prepare, in in creating your your own dish. You know, how was that part of being a creative, experimenting, mixing, combining, or blending? Okay. With maybe camarones or. or you want to use the mic? Okay. Oh, <laughs> go ahead and start with it. Was it was at the beginning? Um, yeah, with this, this soup, actually, I was, um, some of you all asked me how the rabbit was cooked, and it was through a sous vide method, so that's very, like, my grandma didn't do that, <laughs> right? Uh, and the other is the consomme, to clarify it, is a French technique, and so that's, that's where the scholars come in. How did she do it? No, uh, how did she do it, right? Where was that technique from? Because I only know one way to clarify a consomme, and that's the French way with the egg whites and the raft and all that. So I, but it was a very, it, it was a consomme. Um, I also, the mistake I had was trying to chefify it. Is that a word? Oh. You see, yeah. I know, right? The ego is so wild. <laughs> yeah, sometimes grounding. Lessons keep coming. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I was breaking my head and I was saying, it needs, it needs pizzazz, it needs like, 
it needs me, and right? And what I needed to do is just understand it. I need to literally meet the dish where it's at and it's, in, in its humility, uh, in its stock, appreciating the stock, appreciating the carrot, appreciating the tiny little petal. And I, I needed to slow down my creative process, right? And so uh, that was my mistake lesson and, and takeaway from recreating it. Oh, me too? Okay. Um, oh, cool. Um, for me, it was really interesting to make this dish just because it's something that, like, I don't have a reference point for. Like, my family weren't great cooks. We grew up, like, I grew up with a single mom. Um, so it was just, like, a lot of, like, processed foods and, like, very basic things, like spaghetti with salsa ragu or, like, frozen flautas. Um, which like also speaks of like Monterrey and the industrialization of that region. Um, but I've been like trying to really get like really good at making tamales just cause like I remember like the feeling that I would get like whenever I would have like a good one growing up, uh, which was rare. And it's like to make this dish that like honored miski as a flavor and as an ingredient um, was like tricky because like there was batches that I made that were just like very mesquite heavy and it's like I'm like trying to enjoy it but then I'm like criticizing myself because I was like either really dry or just like kind of like blasting my palate um, so I was like trying to find like a balance of what I wanted that flavor to be like for me um, I've also made like a fermented mesquite tea with like the mesquite beans and that's something that like I've never been taught or I've never tasted or I've never seen um, made like in my lifetime. And it's like trying to like tap into like some sort of like just like intuition of like what do I want it to taste like and what does that taste like for me? Um, I think that the mal, like it just took like 10 different iterations to like get it to be okay. <laughs> um, and like, yeah, just using different fats. Like I was like contemplating and like not using pork fat because I'm like, this is also like an ingredient that has been like imposed into us. And then like part of me was like, maybe I should make a vegetarian, I use Crisco and I'm like, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, tried making like the butter out of pecans and I was like, it was just like too crazy in some ways. So it's just like, there was a lot of mistakes in making it, and I, I think my cooking is a lot of that until like, I find a place where I'm like, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got this down. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Those were great. Yeah. <laughs> you, need to, you need to come to Arthur Malava. Yes. <laughs> um, I used a food processor. That's the only thing that my mom, I'm sorry, mom, that, that I changed from the recipe. But for any recipe that I share or I document, I try to not change too much because I, I'm really trying to capture my abuelita and my mother's essence for my daughters, for my sisters who don't cook, <laughs> for my brother, for our nieces, because I want lo de Rubalgava Martinez y Rodriguez to keep going. I want our comida casera to go to one generation, to the next generation. And ahorita soy la única, I'm the only one in the family that does it, and I'm fine doing it because I love it. So I don't try to change too much. Even today when I was serving, I, I was like, it's not gonna taste like my mom's. There's no way it's gonna taste like my mom's because my mom is my mom's. But hearing the feedback warmed my heart, thank you very much. But I use the food processor, my mom would di dice everything, that's the only thing I changed, but everything else is puño a puño lo que hizo mi mamá. So I try to keep it as close as I can to the memory. I wanted to let you know that if the panel hadn't started when it did, I'd have come back for seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> so uh, uh, with my dish, I think I was trying to get the idea, um, you know, across um, of, of, you know, trying to link uh, our region, uh, Native peoples, what they were eating, and, and so, uh, and those, you know, and some specific ingredients. You know, and I think my education, you know, definitely helps, you know, as far as, you know, how am I going to, you know, I, I wanted to kind of show you all, you know, what a, the blossom of a yucca, you know, tasted like. And, and I couldn't uh, pick them, you know, and bring them. They're just not available. They were, they were available a month ago, but not today. 
you know, but my, my, my knowledge and experience, you know, um, the Belgian endive, I knew was going to be a good substitute because of the texture uh, and the flavor profile. Um, so, you know, that definitely helped, you know, and, and as far as uh, the chapota also to try to recreate that dressing, you know, I had to kind of build it from, from a few different fruits. Um, as far as, uh, like, my grandmother's stuffing, um, you know, the, the process um, is, you know, is similar, but um, I kind of break it down a little more technical. I mean, I guess she, she would basically um, uh, cook one ingredient at a time and, and just kind of, you know, add them in the dish, you know, for example, the meat, and she would throw in the fruits and, and all that. And so what I, what I did is, is, I guess, a little more um, technical. So I, I kind of cooked everything separate and then brought everything together at the end. So um, the flavors would uh, kind of set apart uh, and wouldn't meld too much together. So like the fruits, some of them I soaked them a day in advance and I let them get plumped to a certain texture. Some I put in dried. Um, I cooked the vegetables separately. So it's, it was, it's a little more technical than my grandmother uh, would have made. I just want to ask you just one question. Yeah. What did you soak? The, the raisins were soaked in um, uh, uh, brandy. Yeah. Brandy, well, brandy and he asked. He asked what. No, there was no added sugar in the dish. No, all the sweetness wow. came from the dried fruit itself. Not one bit of extra sugar. Did, did you hear it? Yeah. What was the question? The question was, what did you soak it? What did you soak and what did you soak it in? The raisins were soaked in brandy. Brandy and, and the apricot. So I soaked the raisins first overnight, and then I drained off the liquid. And then I soaked the apricots for about an hour so that they would get, um, so that they would not be so firm, uh, but I didn't want them to get uh, very soft either. Yeah, that sounds just amazing. Um, it reminds me a lot of like the 17th century type of recipes that I've seen, right? Yeah, like in Mexico, like the, the, the savory and sweet. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing these amazing recipes. Um, I particularly like that you've highlighted indigenous um, culinary techniques, you know, from steaming food to making moles and bringing the confluence of all of those flavors together um, to roasting. My question is, you know, I know that um, Andres, you talked about you know learning some of these culinary techniques. Some of you may have grown up with these culinary techniques. What is a culinary, an indigenous culinary technique that represents Texas Mexican comida casera that grounds you in the work that you do? Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Carne asada. Sorry. Carne asada. I mean, that's it. Show of hands. Anybody know who carne, what carne asada is? I mean, that's really where I got my start. Um, my father would grill every Sunday, and starting probably from the age of 12, um, I started grilling myself. I'm like, I'm going to do what Dad's doing. And uh, one of my friends, uh, one of my best friends, I mean, we would always, always cook together. Um, on the grill, and and one time I chopped one of my mother's trees down. She had bought this tree, and and the bark was gray. And she called it the silver dollar tree. I, I don't know. I thought it was dead because the bark was gray, and I chopped it down, and she almost killed me. Uh, she came back. What did you do to my tree? I'm like, well, I thought it was dead. And no, anyway. Um, but yes, carne asada grilling. I mean, that's really where I got my start, and um, um, and um, yeah, it was the biggest influence I think to me, and to this day, it, it it's. I tend to gravitate towards uh, grilled meats a lot. Like I'm, I just, I love it, and I love the feeling. I love you know making the fire, um, you know standing over it in a beer, um, you know for sure. And, and you know, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. I think yeah. yeah. A dish, a dish, yeah. Yeah, okay. a, a culinary <coughs> technique. A technique. Of, oh my gosh, there's so many that. I found you in the tradition of. The I would the molcajete. Mm -hmm. 
the grinding from start to finish and the way you continuously add things to the molcajete and it starts to create layers of flavor and a paste. You put the little agua in there, you know, their chicken broth or whatever you add, and then you put it in the sartén and it sizzles and it's just this <laughs> experience that I've seen my mother and my grandmother do it and now I do it and my daughter does it now. And I think, like Adan said earlier, you pass on the molcajete from, I have my grandfather's uh, molcajete, which will in turn go to my, my oldest daughter who's a chef also. Well, she's a chef. I'm a cocinera. Um, and um, I would say the molcajete. Uh, same. Yeah, like molcajetes, um, metates, like we use a metate at the restaurant like as much as we can. It's not like every day because it's a commercial setting and it's it hurts my heart. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I love using stone technology a lot. Like I, more than a chef, I would identify more like as a molinero. Like I love grinding masa, I love grinding moles. I use a molino to like do all that work. Um, just cause like that's kind of what I have access to right now. Uh, and I'm able to do it in larger batches. Um, that and like steaming, I think steaming is like really beautiful and it's also like really powerful. Uh, yeah, I think um, se come todo, utilizing every single part of everything, of the carrot, of the animal, of of, of, of everything. Um, I uh, the most powerful thing in my consomme was out of the bones, right? And and I think that that um, I don't know as our as we're redefining consumer culture, specifically amongst the food industry, uh, we, can, we can ground in that for sure. We can use that technique in grounding and, and building menus that showcase one ingredient from a farm that's special in many different ways, utilizing the scraps in different ways. Um, and if we are gonna have protein in our menus, they need to be, you know, you need to have the ears and the everything and educate people. Um, educate ourselves that we need to start consuming that, even if it's, then we can apply new techniques to make sure we ground in, in, in that value. Yeah. Wow, it's so, it's so moving. It's, thank you very much for all those answers. I would like to invite our chefs, the other chefs who did not cook, if you'd like to make any comments or ask any questions, and then we'll move it to the audience. Sure, I'll start, I have a question, are there seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Are there seconds? <laughs> Chef, why cold smoke? So I decided to cold mic. smoke. Use the mic. Oh. I decided to, to cold smoke because I didn't want to risk um, maybe overcooking them. So I wanted to give them the smoke first, and then I would just roast them off in the oven. That's basically why. Any of the other? Any I, questions or I comments, a, even I comments? Had a, I had a question, but it kind of... It went, okay. Yeah, sorry. All right. So, the, you, oh, Chef Rebel Mariposa from San Antonio. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if I have a question as much as I just want to um, thank you all for what you did. Um, it was gorgeous. It was um, delightful. Each of the dishes had something that just made me feel... Um, things that were memorable, but also things that were new. So I think that you did exactly what was maybe asked of us to do in this really beautiful way. And like uh, my grandmother uses raisins in her stuffing. And so that was really beautiful to, you know, have that memorable feeling and just, oh, you know, um, this reminds me of, of my abuelita, you know, who uh, has some Italian descent. So that was really nice. Um, and... Yeah, just sharing your um, stories too. Thank you for the storytelling. That was, I think, that's my favorite part. Um, so yes, that's that's my comment. So thank you. Are there any uh, uh, questions that you might have of the scholars? When I was eating, uh, there were there were there were questions about progeny and digging and things like that. So you can also ask questions of the scholars. If the audience or oh Joseph, you have said you just remembered. I forgot the question, so I don't remember at all. Okay. It was just a comment about um, uh, Chef Andres's tamal. Um, 
for someone that you said that you had, you don't have too much experience eating like good tamales growing up. Um, to me, it took me really home, like took me home. I ate a lot of tamales growing up. You know, my 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 abuela, my mom, my aunts, they would always make them during the holidays, and it was just really good. And then the with the mesquite, which is like super close to me because I grew up with that a lot. So thanks. That's it. Great. Um, may I share that what you shared with me about Maximilian traveling to Mexico, or because uh, we were trying to identify for the scholars, we we're trying to identify like the consomme clarifying consomme technique, how it got to my like shaman grandmother's kitchen, and then you you mentioned. I'm, I'm no scholar myself, so, so please feel free to correct me if I'm saying something that's, that's not correct. But uh, France dominated Mexico for a number of years, and French cooking was very much the high fashion thing to do. And so I was just saying perhaps that you know, clarifying a consomme was something that might have been passed down in Mexican families that cooked. Thanks to the Battle of Puebla, though, well, right? We got rid of the French. <laughs> Dr. Montano, any comments? Any comments? <laughs> take, take the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, they, yes, that, that kind of cultural information tends to be diffused, you know, and it arrives at the border. I think extensively during the 1747, 1740s, when they start to establish, you know, Laredo, Camargo, Mier, and all those that they brought a lot of their uh, ingredients and foods and cooking techniques. Uh, so they, um, yeah, it, it's a historical thing. Also the bread, also that was great, and also the the, the social class identification. You know that even in my border town there were. Mexicans that prefer, you know, white bread because they were middle class and la tortilla was not, it had a, a certain kind of stigma. Um, and still is, you know, bread is, is very great, I eat it, and, but it has some social connotations to it that, that people use. Um, the thing about the hunting with all of you, you know that you come from a hunting region yes. and the quail is incredible too and smoking is also an indigenous form, whether it's cold or hot. So I'm very impressed with all those cooking techniques. And also, your training is incredible. It's your formal training, right? Thank you. I helped you a great deal. Thank you. Yes, yes. it helped, absolutely. And you want to have something to say to them? Nothing. Are there any questions? No, we'll open it up. First to the chefs or comments. Go ahead, please. So I have a question for the chefs and for the scholars. Uh, for the chefs, uh, those who participate and those who are going to participate, will you be sharing any recipes, any techniques, whether it's for things that you're presenting today or this weekend, or anything that perhaps you'd just like to share with us? And for the scholars, <coughs> along the same lines, do you have bibliographies, uh, current research that you would be willing to share with us? Uh, you know, so that we can learn more about this on our own. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that a no? <laughs> Science. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think we can compile the recipes, right? And, and, and have it uh, Encuentro's first cookbook. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <Definitely. laughs> yes. And every recipe will have a story. Yeah, I'll be down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, well, with, with my recipes, I, I didn't really, because um, the dressing, I, I just made it, you know, by taste. I didn't measure out uh, things, you know, I put some pecan oil. So, I mean, I can kind of guesstimate, uh, more or less, but yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, but don't hold me to the flavor, sorry. <laughs> 
in the bibliographies of the scholars or, or something? Yes, you know, I can share an extensive bibliography if you give me your email and I can attach it and send it. Okay, yes. Okay. And, and same here. Um, I'm excited that I will be teaching an inaugural course on Mexican-American foodways in San Antonio. So I'm, I'd be very happy to share, you know, the syllabus. That would be great. I can do the same thing and share the, the syllabus because I taught a course on first contact when Hernan Cortez arrives in Veracruz and marches into Mexico City. So I had a, did a field work with students where we replicated that that trip and documented foods and everything. So I can send that to you too. And um, just to warn you, tomorrow I only have two slides and just maps, but I have slides that I can send you, okay? Pictures, if you like pictures, okay? And my publications are mostly very boring technical reports or journal articles where counts and wakes, weights of limestone rock are recorded, but I want to share with you. <laughs> Archaeology fans in the house. I, I want to share with you a Texas archaeology website that is written with the general reader in mind. And there is a, there's a children's section as well and exercises for teachers if, if there are teachers in there. Uh, and there is also at the end of each section a very extensive bibliography that will take you into the technical literature if you're interested in that. The website is Texas Beyond History. So all one word, texasbeyondhistory.net, which probably tells you the date that it was established, that it's a .net and not a .org. But, but it's kept up to date. It's, it's housed at the University of Texas at Austin at their Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory. Highly commend it. And I did pull a couple images. Uh, you may have noticed in my slideshow ones that had texasbeyondhistory.net, where I pulled images from, from that site for my presentation. Thank you. I, uh, I want to share a story about recipes that happened during the Encuentro. If you, uh, if you look at the, uh, and it's about uh, food, relationships to storytelling, relationship to uh, relating to another person, honestly, and for a long time. Uh, the, in, in your program for tomorrow, we have, we have uh, Chef uh, uh, Arlene K. O'Neill, who was going to cook skillet bread. And we were preparing for that, and we heard from her I think it was five days ago that her daughter had a very serious accident. She had a very bad turn in the, in the hospital and she cannot come. She's with her daughter. And so we were able to find another member of the Caro community. The Caro people are the, are the Indi are Texas, they're Texas. That's where the Texas. So we found another uh, person whom we were going to ask and she said yes. So I said, let me ask. Arlene K. O'Neill to share her recipe so that we could cook it and keep, keep the skillet bread. And she said, uh, that's not the Caro way. This recipe is my family recipe. It's a sacred recipe. When I serve it, I serve it to you. She was gonna, she was gonna gift it to us. And there's relationship there. There's trust there. There's bonding that you expect. There's, there's a very sacred, emotional, and real, real, uh, relationship, that's the power of food. Food conjures possibilities in community. So she said, I can't do it. I, I have to cook it. I have to cook the gift for you. Food is a gift. It's not a commodity. So I thought, that's a beautiful thing. So we chose another uh, uh, dish that, uh, oh, her name is Diana Parton Smith, who's, oh, Diana. Oh, Diana Parton Smith, yes. She's another chef. Tomorrow, you're going to taste her uh, uh, recipe. So she said, yes, my recipe is, is not that type of recipe because other tribes have it. So it's a more well-known recipe. It's a, it's a grape, caro grape dumplings. And, and I'll share with you the recipe. So she sent it. And uh, since she isn't a chef, although she's an excellent cook, I would say you're a chef. We, we did get uh, a local chef, Chef Stephen D. McKinney to agree to cook it. So he will be talking to us about what it's like to cook a treasured recipe that is sacred to, 
to a family. That'll be a really interesting addition. But I just wanted to share that about sharing recipes. There is this other dimension about the Mexican-American, Native American tradition that looks at food that way, which is very different from just passing commodities. It's about relationships. And I, I could say, we could say more, but uh, we'll, are there any other questions? Either comments back there, if not. OK, yes, please. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is like how I handle the mesquite, like the mesquite beans, uh, like how to process them because whenever you harvest mesquite, like um, they don't have much like juice or like pulp in it, you know, like you break it and depending on how fresh they are, like uh, you'll have like either more sap or like it'll just be kind of dry if it's just been sitting on the ground. Um, the way that I work with it is that I, or the, the traditional way to work with it is to grind it on a, on a metate uh, and you make a flour. Um, seed and all. Seed and all, yeah. And then you just, uh, I pass it through a sieve to just get it a really fine powder, uh, which is like a more contemporary way of doing that. But uh, yeah, you, you can eat the whole thing. Uh, I gently toast them just to get a little bit more like flavor out of it. Um, and then uh, I've used the blender, and that works fine. Like, blend it really, really fine, pass it through a sieve, and uh, for small batches, um, that, that kind of works well. Um, just because with the metate, it's like, it's a couple, it's a couple hours, <laughs> which um, I, I haven't had the time. But yeah, that's, that's how I work it. Whenever I ferment with it, uh, I do use like the whole uh, pods, and then like, I'll blend it after I ferment them, um, and then just like strain it after. My question is, um, we all uh, like to have fiestas. And in my family, uh, everyone has a special dish that they take to the fiesta. I want to know, what is your special dish that you take to your fiestas? Who's first? Um, a fiestera. I would, I would, mine is carne guisada. At any fiesta, I'm asked to bring the carne guisada, and I will happily make carne guisada for everyone. I don't think I have one. Um, let, me, let me think for a minute. Pass this down. Um, I usually bring either beans or tortillas. I take pride in both of them. So I'm just like, I'll bring that. Uh, do you remember that one time I went to your house the yeah, first time? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm the ceviche girl. That's who oh. I am. But it's uh, with a lot of fish sauce, jalapeno, and it's more of a Thai Mexican. Chayote, jicama, yeah. So it's like Thailand and Mexico like want to hang out. <laughs> and I, I actually, when, when we first met, we, we hung out and... And you cooked a uh, Japanese curry, right? Yeah. And then uh, with beautiful vegetables, and I took some th some Thai ceviche. So, wow. yeah. That's special. Wonderful. Thank you. There's another question, I think. We have to pass the. Oh, oh, yes, sorry. sorry. Okay, the other chef, will you answer uh, Graciela's question? What do you oh, take? Yeah, what do you take to a fiesta? Gosh. My salsa. My enchiladas. Your enchiladas. <laughs> Depending on what they want, yeah. Yeah, we do so many different kinds, but yeah, depending on the theme, I would say I do enchiladas. Um, so, yeah. Um, for me, a lot of the times it's like a postre or something, or like a pan, pan dulce. Um, when I was, I might have been like four or five, I can't remember, maybe six, I don't know. Um, my grandparents were coming 
from somewhere, um, I don't know if, you're, if anyone's familiar where Umi Glen Mall is in Brownsville. Um, they're passing by, uh, passing by, and near a dumpster, they, there was a little kid, and it was raining outside. And so <clears throat> my grandparents took him in the truck and brought him to their house, and he, had, he was telling them how he had just come over from Matamoros. And um, so they took him in, and he stayed with them for like six, seven years. Um, his name was Israel. And um, I remember on the weekends, I would, when I would stay with my grandparents, um, he would make empanadas. And so I used to sit at the table and just like watch him, and I was always super fascinated. And um, so I had like a re really interest in like cooking like pan dulce or like a cake or something like that. And um, my grandmother was also a retired baker, so I like to bake a lot or make pan dulce. So, <clears throat> or cookies or whatever. Um, so a lot of the times when I'm hanging out with friends, they always usually ask me to bring like some sort of dessert or, that's it, that's mine. That's wonderful. I kind of dominate parties, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm usually like, I'll make everything, you just show up. That's, that's kind of me. When's your next party? <laughs> Tomorrow at Tomorrow. two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I um, do I specialize in plant-based foods, so um, I'm always bringing, a lot of times, something that a lot of times is a salad because there's never a salad. Um, and it's fun to watch my family be like, oh, you brought salad and then it's gone. You know, because like I make the own, my own dressing or I add different things to it. Um, so I try to obviously bring a dish that's very veg, veggie centric and something that I know will surprise them delightfully. So I recently for Mother's Day, I brought um, some green squash that I grew in my own garden and um, some nopales that I got at the flea market that day and, you know, uh, whipped that up and added some spices and, and everyone ate it up, so. Mm. Gosh, that's another menu for tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I think there was one more. Or we, we can, yeah, one more and then. So this is not a hypothetical question. It's more of a chronological question. When the four of you get together and open your restaurant, I have two questions. One is what is going to be the defining paragraph when you tell uh, we simpletons in the media what kind of food you're selling mm. so that we can then interpret that for our audiences? You know, is it Tex-Mex, interior Mexican, coastal Mexican? Is it progressive Mexican? And we want to move beyond that, right? What would be your description of the restaurant you would put together and the second question is, uh, where can I find the reservation link? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> you're opening the restaurant together? Yes, yeah. and you're going to feature the dishes that you serve tonight. That'll certainly be on the opening menu. Yes. How are you going to describe that food to a potential audience? There is some reductive labeling to take into consideration because we do want to be able to explain to people what kind of food this is without them being able to come to this conference this weekend. Truly Texas Mexican. <laughs> there you go. It is not apparent. I'll go along with that. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we're going to come up with it by tomorrow, right? The, uh, yes. I, I always try to, um, uh, I'm going to do it, babe. Okay, I'm going to do it. Uh, denounce nationalities. <laughs> uh, yeah, something about like borders, I don't or Or even restrict food. Um, I love fish sauce, man. That's like my heart, and that's not indigenous. <laughs> it is because shrimp, dried shrimp, right? Uh, anchovies, ch charales, like, yes, it is. Uh, but I love deviancy, and I think we need to play more. Our ancestors, our antepasadas, my grandmother didn't get to play. She didn't get to play. She had to metatear and make food and probably learn this consomme from cooking for another family. Um, I want to play. I want to honor them by playing and getting inspired by curiosity in the ingredients that the land provides, 
right? And I don't want to source ingredients from, I mean, maybe sometimes Japan uh, or, or France. I want to source from South Padre Island. I want to source from Laredo. I want to source from what is in front of me trying to connect with me. Um, so I don't know what you would call that cuisine, connection, storytelling, yes. a terroir, memoir, I don't, I have no idea, yes. but, but I, I, I think uh, I do want to base it in joy. Yes. Um, I think we deserve that. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd like, can I, oh, did you, go ahead, no, please. I'll finish if you, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's hard to like, be in charge of defining like the food that we're cooking because it speaks for itself and like there is always going to be someone else that's going to define that or put words f like for us uh so even if we claim it as something someone else in our community is going to say something else and it's just going to keep on living and changing and morphing and it's exciting to see what the future of this food does look like um for me like i love sci-fi. <laughs> I like to think of like cooking in a similar way. Like there is so much that we can take from the past. And it's like what Nadia's saying, like how do we take our food into like how do we represent our food today? And like where is it gonna be in the future? And like there's no words for that. And someone else would like figure that out. Yeah, it's basically like like layering, you know, from from the food what I try to convey with, you know, simple uh, you know, roasted meats and, and you know, to eventually through time, you know, spices were layered in, techniques were layered in, and, and it's just, you know, you know, been continuously evolving. I mean, I think that's kind of what you're saying. Culture shift, uh, bistro? Uh, <laughs> culture shift, bistro. I'd like to uh, bring this, this, this is a great way to end. To end with questions is a very good thing to do when it comes to food, because the tendency of our writing food writing community is to give answers and not let the people tell the stories, which are always could be open-ended. So uh, I'll know what it's not called. It's not called Tex-Mex. Yes. Uh, yes. So Texas is, a, Texas is a word that comes from my people's language. It means friends. It means allies. Mm -hmm. And my ancestors didn't walk here. They didn't come here on a boat. Creator put us here over 10,000 years ago. So what I see, why are we saying Mexico? Why aren't we saying this is Texan food? It's Texan. Texan. We've, Texas was conquered by so many people, and you can see the, the effect of that. Every one of y'all have been affected by the colonizers that came and you've worked it into what your indigenous ancestors did. That's Texas. So I say the restaurant, when you get ready to advertise the kind of food, is Texan food. <laughs> Texan food. Texan food is consomme, and it's shrimp balls, and it's fish sauce made out of shrimp, and it's carne asada, and it's grape dumplings made out of muscadine grapes. It's all of it. Texan food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As I started with the with one of the uh, with one of the slides, the Native American roots were erased uh, officially by the state. So that's why we have this problem. And I'm glad that we can end this way. And the question is, as we eat tomorrow and then lunch, and then when we end this with a public uh, uh, screening tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Uh, this will be filled because this is by invitation for this type of discussion. That will be a public, uh, public event. When all this is coming together, I would like to see a, a, a sea change in the way that our food is reported, that is not called Texas, that it is called, that, that the recognition that Texas, the Caro people, that's where the name comes from, and that this land has other wonderful spirits going through that that were erased. But we're rec it was never erased with the food, obviously, because the food always spoke. I'd like to end with, end with that, that type of questioning and that one answer. And uh, let's close it, and I'll ask Chris to, uh, to give our final. Let's give a big round of applause to the chefs and the staff.
thank you very much. How was this first world premiere Encuentro? Thank you for being here. You all are making uh, groundbreaking comments, questions, and participation. So we are really, really excited about your, your being here. Um, I want to say thank you to all the chefs who are here tonight. They're going to be presenting tomorrow, so we want all of you to come back. Thank you to all the chefs today. I think, like we commented earlier, um, had this panel not started, we would probably still be eating, right, <laughs> and drinking. So um, tomorrow, we start at 8 o'clock, as Adan mentioned, and um, bring your badge. And, um, you know, you're going to be in for a treat tomorrow, starting at 8. At, um, in the morning, we are going to feature... Uh, breakfast with um, Chef Rebel, um, Chef. What are the? Uh, uh, let me see. Chef I have Victoria Elizondo. Victoria Elizondo, Chef Stephen McKinney, and uh, he'll be serving the recipe by Diana Parton Smith. Thank you for joining us from Dallas today, uh, representing the Cato, the Cato Nation. So we're happy you're here. And then, of course, we're going to have three more great chefs for lunch who are still with us tonight. Chef Luis Olvera. Silvio Cáceres, and Joseph Gomez. So you're really in for another powerhouse menu tomorrow. Um, we do have some gifts for you, parting gifts. There's a, a tote bag for each of you. Like I had mentioned earlier, you're getting a molcajete. You're getting a curated bottle of wine that went with the dishes tonight. Um, you're getting some olive oil from HEB, which is from either, it's one of three. You get something from Chile, Australia. from Australia, or Peru. Argentina. Argentina. Argentina was the other. So it's so just in lick of the draw. And then we also have in your bag a gift from uh, three of the chefs who are here tonight and their cookbooks. So it's mix and match. Yes. <laughs> Chef Sylvia gave us one of her books to put in her bag. Um, Victoria, who was here, I think she had to leave. Is Victoria here? She, she had to leave. She had to leave. The Taco Tastic is also one of the options and then the uh, Don't Count the Tortillas is another book that is in your bag. So it's a mix and match. It's not all three. You can make friends and, you know, haggle over them. Um, and the, the bags are heavy, so you can pick them up on your way out. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, you all. Have a great night. <laughs>